often when I'm out in communities doing reporting or sitting on panels or just talking to audiences like this one, people approach me and they ask me what can they do? How can they be a force of help? And I tell them, I don't know because I'm not an expert. But today you heard from the experts. You heard five distinct voices tell you directly how you can have an impact, how you can reach out to communities, how you can in fact solve this epidemic. Now it's our turn to talk with each other and hear from you. I invite back our panelists, our presenta our, uh, the presenters, so that we can have a conversation. Thank you. Also, while we're waiting for them to approach, I just want to point out to you that we have a microphone here in the room so that if you have comments or if you have questions that you want to ask, please come forward uh, and we'll make time to talk with you. There's one on uh, this side too. Unfortunately, Nelba and uh, Dr. Jim Gabarino had to leave so they won't be joining us for this conversation. Thank you. So I see there are people uh, standing at the mics already um, who are eager to, to ask some questions. But before they get started, I wanted to kind of circle back to a point that Eddie made, which is that he pointed out that access to resources is limited in Chicago. And I'm sure you saw that in Philadelphia. I know you see that in Boston. Can you address that particular disparity issue, the fact that the resources tend to be concentrated in the most well wealthy communities, but the problems that we're trying to address are in the more poor communities. Well, I'll start. I'll say that this is one of the reasons that we have to advocate for universal access to health care. When you look at the types of services that are often needed, there are services that uh, mental health practitioners provide. And uh, often, if people don't have a way of, um, or if systems don't have a way of funding those services, people aren't gonna have access to it. And so we, we have to make sure that people have access to those services regardless of what zip code that they work in mm -hmm. or live in. What do you find, Dr. Ken Scherf? I agree absolutely with Dr. Evans. I do want to, not to be too uh, pessimistic, however, because one of the areas where I think we can get better is first on sort of the public policy side, uh, alluding not only to healthcare, but also quality of education, which is a game changer for folks. But another way in which we can get better is that I'm often surprised um, that greater effort has not been put to organizing the resources that communities have that are in those communities already. So uh, at one point in the 1980s, early 1990s, uh, Boston had the highest juvenile homicide rate in the country. And uh, there were things that people did on a policy level and a law level and so forth, but I think the real game changer was when the leaders of faith communities uh, banded together and created a coalition that they called the Points of Light Coalition and began organizing the resources of the small nonprofits, the people who were running uh, music and dance studios, theater, all kinds of things that were available to people in their own communities, but they didn't know how to access it or they didn't have the funds to access it. Mm -hmm. So I think we do need these kind of policy and law changes, absolutely, but I think we can be better in the, uh, in, in the way that a crafty public health person is in scavenging about in the environment for resources that we may be overlooking or not using as effectively as we could if we were coordinating them and getting our highest risk, highest need kids there. Mm -hmm. For the, the people in the audience who are on the ground, if they want to insert themselves and not wait for universal health care or wait to be organized, what do you recommend in terms of them actually mobilizing themselves in an effective way? Well, I think that um, psychologists, you know, one of the things I, I noted when I was a commissioner, I was a public policy person both in Connecticut uh, and then in, in Philadelphia. And um, what I saw all of the time is that many of the skills that psychologists have 
are needed in systems. And there are two problems. One is that people who are in policy making positions don't understand the skill set and the training that psychologists have. Mm -hmm. And then psychologists don't always know where the opportunities are in, in these kinds of systems. And I think we have to do a better job of connecting those two things. It's one of the things that we're very interested in right now at APA. It's like, how do we help c connect the dots? I'll tell you, you talked about the issue of access to care. You know what, I, I think in addition to having funding for some of these services, we need to evolve these services. You, you had asked about a public health approach mm -hmm. earlier. If we took a public health approach to mental health, what would that look like? Right now, our systems are not designed that way. Uh, when I was a commissioner, we, we asked the question, what would be the analog to hand washing for mental health? What kinds of things can we do in our communities that would have the same impact that washing hands has on us developing infections? What could we do to protect and enhance people's mental health before they were in crisis um, in order to um, prevent people from developing uh, uh, more significant issues. Those are the kinds of things that I think psychologists are really well equipped to, to um, help develop. And I think we need more of us working, developing those kinds of strategies, using our skills, using our science, uh, to work with communities and to listen to communities because communities and people in those communities often know the solutions. What they don't have are the technical skills that we bring. Mm -hmm. So it's about making these communities talk to each other and form cohesive relationships with each other. Absolutely. Okay. We, we have so many people who want to ask questions. Yes, sir. Can you introduce yourself first? Yes. My name is Ron Levant. I'm a former APA president and current policy advisor for APA Division 51, the Society for the Psychological Study of Men and Masculinities. It was pointed out that the majority of violent crimes are committed by boys and men. Yet the only reference I heard to masculinity or to men was an unfortunate essentializing comment that if we move people with penises from Illinois to Indiana, we'd end crime. I want to point to, out to you in the audience that there exists over 45 years of research connecting the uh, endorsement and conformity to masculine norms with a variety of forms of violence, including sexual violence, gun violence, and the violence that men do to themselves through their health habits. There was a meme going around at the time that the APA guidelines for boys and men was released, and it showed a little boy slumped in the stairs, and the caption read that if somebody had shown this boy empathy and compassion, rather than made him feel ashamed of himself, for violating norms, there would be one less violent man in the world 10 years from now. Thank you. Thank you for your comment and your passion. My name is, um, my name is uh, Tom Plant, and I'm a pro psychology professor at Santa Clara University in Northern California and a clinical professor at Stanford and uh, in Palo Alto. And I represent uh, Division 36, Psychology, Religion, Spirituality, for the Council of Representatives here. First off, let me say how grateful I am to you all and how grateful I am for this session. In my 35 years of coming to APA, I'd say this was the, one of the most, most powerful and important sessions to ever attend. And, and the, set, the last speaker, was probably the most compelling speaker I've ever heard at APA in my 35 years. You know, my question to you is it seems like our biggest obstacle is Capitol Hill. And my question to you is, I think that so many people of goodwill that want the common good, that want to use public health approaches, and that prefer to use good data and best practices agree that we can work together collaboratively to make a better world, but somehow people in Capitol Hill seem to think otherwise. And so my question to you is how can we be more powerful, more influential, gather together better so that we can turn Capitol Hill around and do something reasonable, appropriate for everybody? 
Uh, well, uh, for my good friend Tom, Dr. Plant, I, I would say I don't think the, the biggest problem is Capitol Hill. I think the biggest problem is us. And I think that because the people on Capitol, po politicians, my, my experience, I've worked in a political environment for 20 years. Politicians are pretty easy to understand uh, most of the time. Uh, and the, the issue is this. It is safer for them to maintain the behavior that they are exhibiting than to change that behavior. We have to make it unsafe for people to take the policy positions that they're taking. Yeah. And the way we do that is they have to understand that there is a political price that will be exacted if they continue to maintain that. I, I frankly think that we're, we're building that momentum and, and you can see it changing slowly and slowly. I think we're gonna reach a tipping point, so much like we did with the Me Too movement where things are gonna ch change very rapidly, but we have to continue to put the pressure on so that we get to that trip tipping point as quickly as possible. Good afternoon, my name is Eliana Ramirez. I was wondering if the mother would be able to come back out to the stage as well, um, if mm -hmm. she... Um, as I announced earlier, Nelba is, can't participate in okay. the panel because she has another obligation, so she has to fly out. I'm very sorry. Understood. No, um, thank you. So um, I was in El Paso last weekend, mm -hmm. and I spoke to Patricia Oliver. The Olivers are a Venezuelan family whose son was killed in Parkland. And they were there painting a mural on the side of Las Americas Immigration Advocacy Center that was drawing attention both to uh, migrant detention facilities, as well as gun violence in this country. They were in Ciudad Juarez when the shooting happened, when the massacre happened in El Paso, and they were getting a lot of text messages, and they said, well, wh why are people contacting us? What does this mean? And somebody with their envoy said, there was a mass shooting, and so they texted back, we're safe, we're in Ciudad Juarez. And for folks who are aware, it is a striking juxtaposition to say, I'm safe, I'm in Ciudad Juarez, because of the history of violence there. Uh, and as a social worker, speaking to the media who was there, they asked me, is this an issue of mental illness? And my response is, because racism is not in the DSM does not mean that it is not a maladaptive way of living in the world, and maybe we need to call it a mental illness. We need to look at this more clearly, because Youth of color at this point in time are not showing up and doing these mass shootings in the way that they are. As a Latinx person, it is very scary for me right now. I'll end with this last comment, which is that after the ICE raids recently, community members from Mississippi were going in and bringing clothes and food to the children who ended up being um, orphaned by the end of the day because their parents were taken. My understanding is that community has received uh, threats that if Donald Trump is not elected for a second term, that the Latinx community will experience something worse than the night of shattered glass, which is a time in which Jews were killed en masse in one night. And so again, I just wonder, why are we not considering racism and all of its history here as a type of ma extremely dangerous maladjustment? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Arthur, is that something we well, you know, I, when uh, I was talking to reporters during this week um, and they were talking about this issue of mental illness, um, I had to talk about what the research said and, and you heard Dr. Kinshroff talk, talk, talk about some of that, that mental illness is a relatively weak predictor of whether people are gonna commit these kinds of events. I think that the it's important for us to talk about what's really underlying um, some of these acts. When people flew planes into the World Trade Centers, it wasn't because they were mentally ill. They knew exactly what they were trying to do. They were trying to create fear in the American public. And to call that a mental illness, I think, does a disservice to people who have a mental health condition. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have to be really clear we have to be really clear about what's going on here and hatred uh, is something that's been with us. Bigotry has been something, something with us. Um, and I think we have to treat mental illness and people having those kind of conditions differently. Mm -hmm. 
I asked you to respond because you have been so direct about responding to the fact that it was bigotry, that it was prejudice, that there was hateful rhetoric involved and not mental illness. Thank you. On this side. Dr. Dr. Vicki Mays, I'm with the University of California, Los Angeles, but I'm a native Chicagoan. And first of all, I have to say to Dr. Evans, Chicago was the place to have this conversation. So I appreciate that, you know, despite disrupting the conference, you did this. So thank you for doing this. Thank you. I want to thank Dr. Kimtroff for bringing the science to bear. Because I think one of the things that's very important right now is for us to understand when we talk about gun violence, that what we need to start doing is to be specific about the many epidemics mm -hmm. that are occurring. One of the ones that I presented on while we were here, and I thank everybody who came, was to talk about guns in terms of legal intervention. And when I'm talking about legal intervention, what I'm talking about are police shootings, mm -hmm. the police shootings of black men. So right now, we are very caught up in you know, what's been occurring in terms of the mass shootings. But I want us to also step back and think about, as, as your mayor said, you know, kind of the day-to-day -day things that are going on. And part of what our science really needs to do is to focus on not just the people who are the victims, but the perpetrators. The peop we have an instance in which we have individuals who legally have a gun, and because of their perceptions, of black boys as being older, their perception of blacks as being scary, their perceptions. In our research, Dr. Cochran presented research using the National uh, Violent Death Reporting System that challenges that. So Dr. Kipshar, I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit about that epidemic of legal interventions where people who have been given a gun are actually killing at record numbers, young black boys and men? Sure. So I think when I last look, um, authorized shooting, for want of a better term, because uh, I'm not clever enough to think of another one right now, but an authorized lethal shooting is the eighth leading cause of death amongst African American males between the ages of about 10 and 25 or 30. It's a real thing. Um, I don't know whether we've kept enough data for long enough to know whether this is better, worse, or about the same as it always has been, because until fairly recently, nobody was mm -hmm. keeping the data, and even the data that is kept now is not shared widely and is often flawed. Mm -hmm. That being said, I think that there's clearly a process uh, involved here that uh, is, is described nicely by the implicit bias research. Uh, but I also want to stay open to other kinds of hypotheses worth testing. It was a study recently reported, I think it was 990 or around that number of cases of police shootings where they, the researchers went out and independently verified the data and collected the case data and they collected information that is not always in the official accounts uh, or recorded in the law enforcement data, which would be things like ethnicity of the officer involved. And when they controlled for um, ethnicity, uh, number of police officers, uh, black, white, Hispanic in the police force, and rate of uh, uh, crime rate in the community in which they served, um, the race effect washed out. Um, and it, it, I'm just taking this as one study, so don't, I just, I'm using so it to make a point. Right? So it turned out that white officers were not more likely as an ethnic group to shoot black suspects than were blacks or Hispanics. Now, that may or may not be borne out by further research. We all know the one-off study. But it at least raises the possibility, as we have watched police forces increasingly become militarized in their, their training and their perspectives, and the incredible emphasis compared to police officers in other countries on the immediate management of, of a potential situation, including the threat or actual use of lethal force, it may be that 
part of what we're watching would not be solved merely by ethnic diversification of the police force, that there's actually something in the way that we train people, whatever their ethnicity, to do policing in many communities, which increases the risk of these lethal encounters. So that's an excellent example of what I mean by we've got to look at what the data takes us and get beyond our own kind of comfort zone when we may be getting disconfirming information. Thank you. Dr. Vicki, thank you for that question. I'd like to kind of broaden it a little bit and see if I can bring Eddie into the conversation. Because um, when you talk about police shootings and police misconduct, that leads to a certain level of distrust in communities that are over-policed. As a person who's been down on the ground interrupting violence and having to work almost as a mediator between the community that will trust you and the police, can you talk about how those police shootings then also kind of feed the the gun violence that exists on the streets sure so so a couple points that I'll make you know the city of Chicago unfortunately has um, about 20% 20 or 25% clearance rates on homicides and about a 5% on shootings so and that's not including once you go through the court process that number actually declines even far less than that I think in large part what we've inherited here in Chicago and what I've seen in other cities is that race, ethnicity uh, really play a major factor into all this. But, but I think one of the things that, I've, that I've, I've learned and I've noticed as well is that for a lot of individuals, for black and brown folks who come from like inner city communities uh, like in Chicago, their first experience of the justice system is actually that particular beat officer. And ironically, as a kid, I remember, you know, playing with my little Hot Wheels and saying, hey, you know, I'm you know, cops and robbers, you know, and I always wanted to be the cop. I wanted to be the good guy. But by the time you get to about age 10 or 11, I realized that that wasn't the case. I realized that I no longer wanted to be the cop because I started hearing and seeing, witnessing how law enforcement were actually treating many of the residents and my neighbors. And so that emotion, those feelings, started to um, increase as I got older and started now being on the receiving end from law enforcement where at one point I would call the police because there was a domestic dispute in my home and now I wouldn't call the police because now it's the police who is constantly harassing me or taking me from one rival gang neighborhood to another gang neighborhood. And so the distrust actually began there for me at a young age. But I see that very often with the men in our program. I see it where uh, law enforcement, for whatever reason, and this is not, this particular is, is not their, their fault. We as a society uh, ask law enforcement to do a lot of things that maybe most social workers, you know, are required to do. And so I think it's a, it's a disservice there, but at the same time, you have the same officers who are constantly being exposed to trauma, are constantly seeing the worst in, in humanity, and then we expect them to react and respond in a specific way. Now, I strongly believe that there are some officers that I have no idea how, they, how the hell they made it this far. Uh, why weren't they vetted much better? I also see that there, was, there haven't been in the past large efforts of how to bridge between law enforcement and community, mm -hmm. how to build that trust. And it hasn't been to like maybe since uh, Laquan McDonald here in Chicago a few years ago, where it actually forced law enforcement to really revisit this idea of community policing. And so it took the, uh, uh, the, the decree to actually look at that and think about we need to increase our standards of professionalism as well. Mm -hmm. And so when there is a distrust of the police and people feel that they are victimized by the police, but they want justice, then they take it into their own hands because they can't call on the police for justice. You're absolutely right. I, I, a lot of the times, the reason why we have a, clearance, a, a low clearance rate, the bottom line is because there is no trust. Mm -hmm. There is no trust not only in law enforcement, there's no trust in the justice system. Because time and time again, we see the same offense, but two different people, one is black, one is white, one is from Winneka or Deerfield, Illinois, the other one's from, you know, Inglewood, North London, here in Chicago, and the person who more likely is going to be black or brown from those communities is going to exceed the amount of time that they're going to receive versus the other person. Mm. A lot of times because of access to 
private attorneys or because of their own social capital with judges and so on. And so it, it really displaces a lot of the people that we're currently working with because of that reason. It's, it's, it's access to opportunities, it's social capital, uh, it's the advocacy that comes behind the people. But the bottom line, it's also classism and racism. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I just add one? one yes, thing? please. Well put. I just want to point out one interesting little irony, which is if we really wanted to look at kind of an operations manual on how we might do policing differently, we might actually look at the considerable research that had been done um, by the military uh, when they were trying to figure out hearts and minds. Anybody remember hearts and minds? This is uh, the process by which uh, you have to provide at least two things in order to successfully navigate a population with whom you're going to interact almost every day and not everyone is going to be happy to see you. The one thing that you have to offer them is a sense that they are safe from you. And the second is that it, you have to offer them a sense of a fundamental fairness in the interactions that you're going to have with them. They may not always like the outcome, mm -hmm. but the fairness is important. And if we can get into a world where police community interactions feel more like I don't have to be afraid of my police officer and whatever happens here is going to be fair, I think we could see a real shift in the dynamics here. Yes, We are running out of time. Thank you for that. Um, but I do want to try to get to your uh, questions or your comments. So if we could just have you state it, state your name, state your question, and then we'll go to the next person and we'll just go through them. And then if there's some, some closing thoughts. My name is Tina Bloom, and um, I am not a university professor or past president of anything. In fact, I was interested in eating disorders, but I had student loans and opened a professional magazine that said, Department of Corrections will pay your student loans. And you don't have to be a psychologist to spend about three days in a Department of Corrections and understand all the contingencies are backwards. We'll have men with a 15-year sentence who spend 14 and a half years learning to be better criminals because that's the only way they don't starve to death or get killed. <coughs> and then at six months before they're released, we give them an absurd program that's completely surface level and stupid. And then we turn them back out to society expecting them to be rehabilitated. And um, I've done a lot of work with these guys. I got assigned to like the worst of the worst. I was in an institution with 2,400 guys, maximum security. 600 had life sentences in a state without parole. Uh, 400 of the 600 with life sentences were under 25 years of age. You know, what do they have to live for? And I brought uh, work in that Gay Bradshaw did where she found post-traumatic stress disorder in free-ranging elephants. And we brought this in and it took the defensiveness out of them and they started responding and they started helping each other. Gang violence went to almost nothing. Why can't more departments of corrections, why can't they be more open to these kinds of programs? Why can't we reach out to them? These men, if we could do some sort of uh, good time behavior or amnesty kind of process with them, they would be great assets back in the community. Why, they're, they're a captive uh, population. Why don't we focus more on helping them and getting them reintegrated so that they can help us with these problems? Thank you for that comment. Over here. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Dr. Frank Curigliano. I'm from New York. Uh, I specialize in telemedicine. I run a program um, that connects children and teenagers with their incarcerated parent through telepresence. Uh, it's a psychologist-directed program. I also do um, telemedicine into rural communities. Um, so Dr. Uh, Evans, to your point, I think it is really important to combat the idea that uh, mass shootings are directly related to mental illness. Uh, and I think it's important to use leverage the mass shooting publicity to address it and put out the information we have. But it is related to mental wellness. And it is absolutely a call for psychological services. So to make sure we're messaging those two things as well. So we don't just say it's not psychology. It is psychology. Um, and then I, I think it's really important that we talked about gun violence in terms of three specific things, mass shootings, suicide, and homicides. If we want to look at the biggest numbers, it's suicide. And I think as psychologists, we need to increase our cultural competency around working with uh, people who own guns and firearms and destigmatize it and be able to have open conversations about gun safety instead of just gun violence and moderate that risk. 
And then um, Eddie, most important, is um, talking about how do you create the safe space, this would be the question, to talk with people about um, having firearms, using firearms, um, when, when it's, you know, they're involved in illegal activities, and how do you create that safe space? Thank you for that question. L look, can I just say one oh. quick thing? Um, um, uh, one of the points that you made I think is really important as we talk about this issue, being mentally well and being mentally ill are, it, it's, it's, more than a, it's more than a dichotomy. People cannot have a mental illness but not be mentally well. Um, and I think we need to, under, and, and the psychologists, we understand that. We understand that there's a continuum, right? And so for the public, though, when they hear us say the person didn't have a mental, mental illness, what they believe then is that we're saying that the person was mentally well, and that's not what we're saying. And I think as psychologists, we understand that, and we have to uh, be able to intervene across the whole continuum of health and illness. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Scott Johnson. I'm an engineering student at the University of Michigan. Um, I, I just had a question about, Dr. Evans, you brought up, brought up an analogy between um, using black boxes in airplanes and how they readily address the problems that are available. I was wondering if you had an, an idea of what data or technologies were necessary to create that type of black box for gun violence so that we can be more readily responsible for the outcomes that we see. What I was pointing out that when, when there's an airplane crash, we send a team in to study. Uh, and sometimes we won't necessarily have that black box when you have these kinds of shootings. But that act and that mentality that we need to go in and try to understand it is what I think we need to have in this country and have some urgency around that. Unfortunately, when these things happen, we have people say, well, we don't need to try to understand what, why this happened in the aftermath. I think that's a political ploy, frankly. Um, and I think we really have to, to challenge that. Um, I would love to see us develop uh, a concept parallel with what NTSB does that is behaviorally oriented to help us understand that. And that's some of the th one of the things we might think about as APA and propose that as a policy change uh, in the terms of how we respond in the aftermath of these kinds of events. We only have time for one more question, please. Okay. Hello, my name is Dr. Shandra Corbett. I am uh, the Community Living Center, which is a veteran-sponsored nursing home at the DCVA Medical Center. And I am also a certified mental health first aid trainer. And um, I believe it was said that in our community, in communities, they really don't understand what resources that already do exist within their communities so they could be greater access to encourage youth to become involved in these communities to help with gun violence. I think similarly, uh, as a mental health community, we really maybe don't even know about all of the mental health resources that are available. We, we can help educate, to help with prevention, intervention, such as mental health first aid. I didn't learn about that through my doctoral program, but I learned about it after. If there's a way that we can all know about the great research, the great things that people are doing within communities about the different resources that could be available to all of us to help empower and educate and strengthen our communities to help address gun violence, depression, suicide, and address so many other concerns that we're discussing today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for taking time to come to this event and talk to us. I see you waving, but unfortunately we have to wrap up. Our speakers have other obligations and places to go, but we're really, really grateful that you would take time out today to come and be a part of this discussion. And let's continue it online. Use the hashtag, please. Thank you.